In this video, I'll be going over caching, which is one of the most important aspects when it comes to performance and system design. This is another video in my system design series, so if you're interested in this topic, be sure to check out those other videos and subscribe for future videos. So what is caching and what are the benefits of using it? In simple terms, when you cache something, you take data that would normally be stored on a hard drive or on disk and you put it into memory. The benefits of this are you improve the speed and performance of your application and as a side result of that, it saves you money long term. If we look at how it works, you can see we have our client that makes requests to our server and what's new here is in between the database and our app server we have our cache so if you look at in this example you have a request if that data is already in the cache it can serve that directly back to our application which then sends it back to the client um, down here is if we don't have that data already in the cache we have to make a round trip to our database we return it and then we take it back to our app server. So the benefit of this is that delivering that data from cache is much more efficient and much faster. So reading from memory with cache, you're gonna see, depending on a couple different factors, 50 to 200 times faster read performance compared to just reading it from your database. As a result of that, we can serve the same amount of traffic with much fewer resources just based on um, simple math of if you're doing something 200 times faster, the same, uh, let's say, server with uh, however many gigabytes of memory, it can serve much more, or many more requests per second with the same amount of resources. Another benefit is that you can pre-calculate and cache data in advance. So this is something that Twitter does with their timelines. They know that users are going to want their timeline very fast, so they'll uh, occasionally pre-compute what your timeline is, so maybe 200 tweets, they'll push that data to cache, and then they can serve it very quickly. So instead of every time you request Twitter having to go to the database, run their algorithm to get your news feed, they pre-calculate it and they can serve it within milliseconds rather than a couple seconds waiting for all that to process. So if you know what your users are gonna need in advance, you can uh, really improve performance that way. Another big benefit is that most apps have far more reads than writes, which is perfect for caching. So again, if you think of something like Twitter, where a single written tweet, so you write a tweet to a database, it's possible that that single tweet will be read thousands or for a bigger account, millions of times. So instead of having for every uh, one of those reads going to the database millions of times, you can put that into cache and it just gets served directly from there instead, which will really help the performance of your application. Let's take a look at a real world example of how this kind of works and how it can make more sense to you maybe, which would be we're gonna use a club with a bouncer and people who want to get in. So this is our club is essentially our application. Inside here we have the owner who would be kind of the database. Our bouncer has the password to get inside and we have our people who wanna get in here. They're like clients or users in a web application. So one way to do it, the smart way uh, that would be like caching is the bouncer has the password in memory, literally in this case, in his memory. And all these people to ask, they say, hey, this is the password. He says, that's right, lets him in. That would be very fast. The other way is theoretically he could, every time somebody gives him the password, he walks into the club, goes all the way to the back room, asks the boss, or in this case, the database, hey, is this the right password? comes back, tells them yes or no. So that would obviously take many times longer for every single one of these people. And um, in real life, these people would get really pissed off. It's like, what is this idiot doing? Why is he continuously going back to the database or going back to the owner to get the exact same information? And that's kind of how you can think about it with a web application is why would you continuously do the same work? Uh, a lot of your data in your app is gonna be the same data getting constantly requested. Like we talked about earlier with tweets, they're asking for the same tweet again and again. Why would you continuously hit your database for that same information? You're much better off storing it up front in your cache, and that's just a better way to build your systems. 
also use caching at multiple different layers, not just in front of your database. The main ones being DNS, um, content, distribution network, CDNs, uh, your application, and uh, like we've looked at, the database itself. Uh, here's a diagram showing this. So you have your client. When you type in like google.com, for example, you don't actually go to Google you go to an IP address and to get that you usually have to access it from a DNS server so instead of going back and forth every time to find the proper IP address it usually makes that request once and then it stores it on the client so you can go to it directly so that's one layer of caching uh, you then have content distribution networks so that's if you've heard about Cloudflare you're probably familiar with it because um, every few months it'll go down and like half the internet will go down so a lot of websites use these and this is another way you can store up front instead of having to get um, static files usually like pictures and videos instead of serving them from your own infrastructure you can push them to these CDNs and that will boost performance they'll serve them back directly um, you then have your app layer and like we said earlier your cache here and most databases also have internally we have inside um, frequently accessed data they'll automatically cache that as well so you have multiple layers all across your application where it takes advantages of the speed boost for, from utilizing caching. Here's some pseudocode with Python kind of simulating how you use a cache in your application. In this case we're just using a built-in dictionary or hash table to simulate this because that's what a cache really is like Redis or memcached it's essentially just a giant in memory hash table. So you see we got our cache, we look up a key value, in this case it's a tweet, so we look up that tweet ID. If that returns data from the cache, we'd return that directly. Otherwise, we do a database query with that ID, we return the data, uh, we set that into the cache, and then we also return it. So this time, when we do this, the next time a user requests that same tweet, it'll hit here and it will return, so we don't have to make that database query. For writes, we've got a similar setup where it's just uh, caching. So in this case, if we're updating a value, we go to our database, we update the tweet, and if the tweet is already in the cache, we want to make sure we remove it so that we don't have an issue with what is called stale data. And we'll go over that a little bit later. But what that is, is that we don't want users seeing the old version of the tweet or whatever data we just updated. So we remove it from the cache so that the next request, if we go back, um, it will re-grab that from the database. And that way we're not getting old data for our users. Building off of simple caching, we have what's known as distributed cache, which it works the same way, but it has built-in functionality to, to replicate the data, um, shard it across multiple servers if our amount of data is too big for a single server, and then locate the proper server to find for each key that we're using. Uh, the main reason you do this is that at scale you don't want your entire system to break down just because your single cache server goes down. So you want some replication and stuff like that so that your system is more reliable. You can visualize it here, so you'd have a active server, you have multiple with different keys, so you have ABC, and you also want sitting here your passive. So if one of these goes down, your application will be able to detect that, and it will reroute to your passive server, which is now the active one. Um, the thing, it might seem wasteful, because what you want is, basically these are going to be identical. They're going to be in communication and have the same amount of data but these under ideal conditions will never actually do anything uh, best case scenario is you never have to use your backups but the reason you have this is that if this cache goes down and all of a sudden all those queries are going to your database you're gonna have big issues because your system is built assuming that let's say 90 some percent of your requests are gonna be served from cache so if these goes down all of a sudden your database are going to be overwhelmed by that amount of traffic. So you have these backups and that's what that's going to help with. Another big thing is that uh, something Facebook wrote about early in their um, company history was that they had big issues with they didn't have this pre, they called it a warm-up, where they didn't have this data 
pre um, put into these caches so they'd spin up this would go down they'd automatically spin up a new one but the issue was that they'd have a hundred percent cache miss initially so uh, everything would go straight through it because it's empty and then it would have to fill up gradually so one of their solutions to this problem was they would do what they call a warm-up and before they even brought these online and made them available they would pre query the database and fill up these caches so that they didn't have that issue. Moving on, a key concept is cache eviction. We need this for two reasons, which is like we talked about earlier, uh, we want to prevent stale data. We don't want something sitting in cache for too long because if it's updated, we don't want um, out of date stuff being served to users. We also want to only cache the most valuable data to save money and resources. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in your database that might never or very rarely be requested so it doesn't really make sense to store that stuff in cache because uh, it's just kind of a waste so first major thing is ttl time to live this is where you could set a time period before cache entry is deleted automatically uh, this is mainly used to prevent stale data and the time that you set can depend on how um, essential it is for data to be fresh so in some cases let's say a blog post it's very rarely going to be updated so you could probably set a longer cache time uh, same thing for something like tweet counts like if you have a tweet and you have a certain amount of likes it doesn't need to be um, immediately updated if there's a few seconds or even a minute where you let that serve stale data it's not a huge deal it's not like there's people's lives depending on the exact accurate count on the number of likes on a tweet. Uh, in other cases, for something that's very important, like something related to healthcare, where it's somebody's heartbeat count or their breathing rate, that you probably don't even want to cache. You want it to be constant live data so that you don't have a delay because that could literally kill somebody. So you don't want that. Um, the TTL time, it kind of just depends on what kind of data you're working with. So LRU and LFU are two other strategies. These have less to do with preventing stale data and more to do with um, trying to keep our most requested data in our cache. So least recently used is um, once our cache is full, we can't obviously add any more keys, so we have to choose what do we get rid of. So this strategy, um, what happens is whatever hasn't been accessed or what was last accessed latest, we get rid of that because it's not being as frequently requested, so it's uh, less risky for us to drop that. Uh, the other one is kind of similar, same concept, which is it tracks the number of times a key has been accessed, and once our table is full, it will get rid of whichever one during that uh, time period has been the least requested. So the concept here is that we want to make sure that highly accessed data, we keep that in cache, less requested stuff it's a little bit safer to request that from the database some examples of this in practice let's we'll keep working with twitter um, let's say we have two different tweets so in our database they're the same size but there's a big difference between a tweet from 2012 from a small account with 10 followers versus a tweet that was just created by an account with millions of followers uh, the one from 2012 or whatever year it was barely is ever going to get requested so it's not a big deal if once a month somebody requests that from the database on the other hand the recent tweet is going to be wanted there's going to be read requests millions of times for it so we want that in our cache so that our database isn't getting destroyed by all those requests another example related to cache eviction is from a facebook case study they called it the thundering herd problem so they'd have a situation where some user would update a post, uh, like a popular user updates a post, they dump that from cache. When you have thousands of requests coming at the same time, when we looked at our pseudocode, we talked about um, on the second read request after we updated, they'd just refresh it. But the problem is when you have thousands or tens of thousands ha of requests every second, what would happen is that a bunch of them at the same time would go straight through the cache and still make that read request which would cause tons of issues from their database so their solution to this issue at scale with cache eviction 
was that they would implement what's called a lease. So they'd have kind of like a backup cache that would still serve that old data while uh, the cache updated in the background. So that's something you probably won't have to worry about, but it shows that at scale, stuff that you really don't even think about, like what would happen if I get thousands of requests during the split second where something updates and gets removed. Uh, most applications don't have to worry about that, but it's kind of interesting that at large scale, um, all sorts of things pop up that you'd never really think about. So there's a couple different caching strategies. The first one I showed with the pseudocode is cache aside, and that's definitely the most common. Um, write through and write back are kind of interesting because there would be more for a write heavy application. So write through what happens is that to increase the amount of writes the database can handle, the cache is actually updated before the database. Um, what this does is it allows to maintain high consistency between your cache and your database, but as a result, it adds latency to whenever a user writes, so it's gonna slow things down um, from that perspective. The write back strategy involves writing cache directly to, or writing data directly to the cache, which is very fast, but uh, a side effect of that is that if your cache fails before it can write that data to your database, you have an issue with data loss. So that's kind of a riskier strategy, but if you really need to scale writes for some reason and consistency isn't essential, that's one way to do it. And finally, we have cache consistency, which I touched on earlier, and that basically amounts to you want to make sure that your cache and your database have this, are showing the same thing. Um, the importance of that, if there's a slight delay, um, it depends on your use case. The biggest thing is that for writes, you want to make sure that the user who's writing data gets that fresh data immediately. Uh, Facebook wrote about that where they had issues where um, users would update a post, maybe they made a typo, or they accidentally posted something they didn't mean to, and they had a, a delay between when they would write it and when the user would see it, and the users were obviously getting upset because they wanted to immediately see that it was showing the new updated post rather than the old one because uh, in some cases if you post the wrong image or something uh, there could be big issues so that's an example where cache consistency is important you don't want an old piece of data showing to other users for a long time that's pretty much it for this video if it helped you out be sure to hit like if you have questions about anything related to caching leave a comment and I'll help you out and be sure to check out uh, all my other videos covering system design concepts uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing.